And if you want, if you still are struggling to believe me, if you want, you can pass these around and play with them uh, until you convince yourself that they are different things. Okay, so how do you talk about axial chirality and <clears throat> the answer is because there isn't a stereo center, rather it's a stereogenic unit, we have to have a new way to talk about it. So um, we're going to draw the Newman projection looking down the bond between, uh, looking down the bonds between the SP hybridized carbon in the middle with the uh, SP2 hybridized carbons in the front and the back, respectively. I can't ever resist drawing Sith eyes. Um, so we're looking down. What would we see? So from our perspective there, we would see the methyl group going straight up and the hydrogen going straight down. There's a carbon in the middle. And then in the back, we would see a methyl group here and a hydrogen there. That's, and as that model comes around, you can confirm that that's the correct Newman projection. Uh, in contrast, if we do the same sort of viewpoint over here, we will find Oops. Okay, which actually we can then just take and go like this. And you can see even in the Newman, sorry, projection, these are mirror images of each other. So your rules for assigning stereochemical configuration here are going to require you to identify the highest priority functional group on either, either end of the alene. Okay? You look down the axis of chirality and then you identify the highest priority functional group on either end of that axis. So here is the methyl group, and, and that's the same con ingold prelog rules. Maybe that's not even the right set of names, but it's the basic rules you use for assigning R versus S and E versus Z. So on the front carbon, carbon is, front carbon here, carbon is uh, heavier than hydrogen, so carbon wins. That's the highest priority functional group. Here it is in the back as well. Do the same thing over here, thanks. Um, and then we look at what kind of rotation uh, gets us, or, or we look at what kind of, we draw an arrow from the highest priority group in the front to the highest priority group in the back, and we notice the sense of rotation of that arrow. For example, here, it is clockwise or in the right-handed direction, whereas here, sorry, it is counterclockwise, which I will abbreviate CCW. So you're seeing we're doing the same kind of thing as we did with R versus S, um, only we only have two groups to worry about. Yeah. The highest priority function would be back and the highest priority function would be front. Yep, and you draw the arrow from the one in the front to the one in the back. Yep. And uh, if it is clockwise, we're going to call that P, which stands for, I, I just looked this up in my notes. You guys were like, what the heck is that? It's plus for like a dihedral angle. Like if you measured that angle, uh, if you did the vector math to measure this angle between this vector and that vector, it would be positive. And then M for minus, for counterclockwise. Um, 
I didn't invent the rules. You're going to tell me that in math, especially in polar coordinates, clockwise is actually positive, or sorry, counterclockwise is the positive direction, and I'm going to say, you are right, but I don't care. Um, anyway. P is R as E as E is. <laughs> right, so P sort of corresponds to R for clockwise and uh, M sort of co corresponds to S for counterclockwise. Um, even though there are these rules, sometimes people use R and S in this case because any, nobody, nobody except us nerds, and yes, you are part of that group <laughs> now because you're in this class, know what P and M mean. So, um, it, Sometimes people will call this R and S. Yeah. Are we going to talk about optical activity? Oh, right. We will talk about optical activity. Um, and when you buy compounds, depending on where they're from, it can be traditional to add a plus or a minus in front of the name. Um, whether it's, this has to do with whether it rotates light in the positive direction versus the negative direction. And that has absolutely nothing to do with the assigned stereochemistry. Okay. So it's not like all, if all the stereo centers are R, then it's gonna be really, really positive. Uh, no, it, yeah, it, they're, they're too, the, the stereochemical configuration is how we keep track of the shape of the molecule, but it's the shape of the molecule that determines the optical rotation. So, so no, there's no, there's no real correlation between whether it rotates light in the positive or negative direction with, with various stereochemical configurations. Um, so alenes, I mean, there's not that many alenes, or, or rather, I don't know that they, they show up that often, certainly not. Um, I don't know, Rachel, you were saying you guys were doing something with an alene, but you're not worried about stereochemistry, right? Yeah. So uh, let me show you a situation where you will encounter axial chirality. And this is when you have bonds between uh, two benzene rings. Oops, I'm going to want to, oh no, that'll work, that'll be fine. All right, we look at that and we think, oh, isn't that lovely? It's all flat, everything's in the same plane. Um, we should try to actually make that be in the same plane. I'm going to try to illustrate this with a model in Spartan because what you're going to see is their steric clashes for the groups on either side of this bond between uh, benzene rings. This is, molecules of this kind are called biarils. If it's just two benzene rings, it's a biphenyl. And uh, sterics are such that you can't have the molecule be flat. So let me demonstrate that in Spartan. Um, and actually, for the molecule I want to draw, those hydrogens there are actually OH groups. Um, but let's see, where did it go? It's not on my list anymore somehow. Oh, I hope it didn't get deleted. I'd be angry if that happened. Okay, so benzene ring, another benzene, oh shit. All right, um, I guess we'll have to do this the old fashioned way. Dang it. Like that? <laughs> this is like abstract. That's abstract art benzene ring. Oh. 
Okay. We'll just clean that up a little bit. Um, all right. Do you see how they're twisted relative to each other? They can't be flat. We drew it here as though it were flat because we can pretend um, on paper. But in reality, you have to remember that atoms take up space. They're not just points. Uh, they, rather, the nuclei are basically points, but the electron density around the atoms takes up space. So you can see in the space filling model that if I were to try to make this flat, this is going to bump into that, and this is going to bump into that. In other words, it's stuck. Now, um, presumably at a high enough temperature, if you give the molecule enough kinetic energy, you may be able to get around that rotational barrier. But uh, for molecules like this, by aryls or by phenyls, the uh, rate of rotation is slow enough that you can actually isolate the two different enantiomers. Um, let me try to illustrate, I'll come back to this, let me try to illustrate what I mean. Um, for the simple molecule butane, we could draw a Newman projection for butane, uh, and I'm going to draw it in the gauche conformation. We could, for the same molecule, just as easily have drawn another gauche conformation. Maybe you remember us talking about this. Sometimes you call one gauche minus and one gauche plus. Um, can you see how those, those two are mirror images of each other? So why do we not say that those are two enantiomers? Right, the rotational barriers are small enough at room temperature or whatever temperature we're interested in that they are easily traversed, which means that we don't really, I mean, I, uh, I don't remember if you recall if this is energy and then we have sort of dihedral angle here for the, the angle between the two methyl groups. Uh, we had a, energy, a potential energy surface uh, that looked something like this, where there was uh, an anti-conformation, and then a gauche conformation, and then a, another gauche conformation. And so what we're saying is that there's enough energy at room temperature if you're here um, you can go back here and then over here. Um, this is like zero and this is like 360, or um, no, close. That's like 360. Oops. Yeah. Um, so you go from one gauche to the other. Uh, easily at room temperature. Now the question is, what if I made the barrier between gauche conformations so high that you couldn't get from one to the other? Then they would be in antiomers. So this is another uh, axial chirality is one of these things that doesn't depend on stereocenters. It depends on your ability to rotate around a single bond or around a set of bonds. So what we're saying is that for, um, for the molecule uh, known as binol, that's uh, stand, bi stands for the bi aryl, and nol N stands for um, 
Is it all capitalized? Well, Anybody knows? N stands for naphthalene, which is t uh, the two fused benzene rings, and then the all is the alcohol. Um, so if we were to look down the, uh, look at the molecule as though we were looking down this carbon-carbon bond, um, what we would see is, and I'm not even going to attempt to draw atoms, but this is the edge that has the OH group, and this is the edge that has the ring, and then let's say this is the edge that has the OH group, and this is the edge that has the ring. And what we're saying is that the two possible options, you can consider these as though they were two different gauche conformations. Why is this not going to shrink for me? <laughs> uh, what we're saying is you can't, that the process of going from the conformation on the left to the conformation on the right is too slow because presumably the energy barrier between this conformation and that conformation is so astronomically high as to not be possible at room temperature. Um, so I don't actually know how they generate or isolate those um, stereoisomers of binol. Anybody, so anybody worked here with binol before? Sometimes it's a ligand uh, for various and anti-selective catalysis types of things. With each other? Mm -hmm. um, you know, it sort of looks like they might be able to hydrogen bond with each other, um, depending on if I rotate this carbon-oxygen bond and put the proton over there. So I wouldn't be surprised. Um, and I know that you can, I mean, if you look, those two oxygens are, oxygens are actually close to each other. So you can use those to chelate some Lewis acid, whether it's an ion or a boron or aluminum or something. Is there a way to check the distance between, what was it called, the other um, diagram? Okay, you want to see distance? Yeah, yeah there you go. I wonder information. Oh, yeah, sure. Between the two oxygens? Three and a half, 3.7 angstroms. So is that It's enough? decently close for a, that, that would be close enough for a hydrogen bond. Um, but people will use this. Uh, as a ligand for various Lewis acids in an antioselective catalysis, trying to use the axial chirality here to induce or to favor one enantiomer over the other. All right, so I don't know that there's much more to say in terms of axial chirality other than be aware of it because it exists. <laughs> okay. Um, some stuff about symmetry. I wonder if we should talk about it. Mm, why not? Um, okay, so I don't know. Maybe we'll actually skip over the symmetry because. Uh, oh, sorry, I can't decide. <laughs> okay. Brief symmetry lesson. This is going to help us in determining whether various groups are homotopic, and antiotopic, or diastereotopic. This is a subject that people in the NMR class hate, right? <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right. And, and this will really help because 
when I first I learned it for determining diastereotopic versus an antiotopic, they were talking about some weird thought experiment. Well, if I replace this group with a Z, we're not going to do that. It's all about symmetry operations instead. So, a uh, couple of terms that you may have encountered, especially if you're taking um, inorganic 514, probably they've taught you about this in a lot more detail than I'm going to. A proper rotation is uh, called CN, where uh, N tells you uh, how many degrees to rotate. It's a so uh, CN is rotation about an axis that you designate by 360 divided by N degrees. Uh, and a proper rotation is a rotation that about that axis by 360 divided by N that leaves the molecule unchanged. So uh, you may have heard of um, C2 or C3 symmetry, but an example of uh, a proper rotation would be if I put an axis of rotation in the middle of this molecule and I then rotate by 180 degrees. So I'm going to take this OH group and rotate by 180 degrees. Uh, that will be called a C2 rotation. And uh, when I do that, I will find, I mean, I can't really label OH groups, but I'm just using color to highlight the fact that we've actually done a rotation. All right. But do you see how those are the same thing? Yeah. That molecule is C2 symmetric. All right. Questions so far about that terminology? Steering wheel, steering wheel action. So uh, the axis is right here, 180 degrees. Yeah. What? Oh, not not front to back. Steering wheel action. So um, sometimes I tend to. It's tough to visualize things on uh, on a flat sheet of paper. So um, we'll call this steering wheel action where this is the spoke and then we're literally putting our hands and twisting the wheel. Okay. Um, when I mean flip something over, that's kind of the same thing, just in a different plane. We'll, we'll do, uh, we'll get out our spatula. which, you know, if we're bored, we can color instead of moving on with things. Um, we can do the pancake flip, where you literally stick your spatula under that molecule and then flip it over. Uh, and that will give you this. Uh, so, did I do it wrong? Nope. Okay. So, um, yeah, you can use the proper rotation, or you can terminology, or you can say steering wheel or pancake flip symmetry. <laughs> They're both the same thing. Pancake flip symmetry puts the axis of rotation here, and then you rotate around that axis by 180 it degrees. Uh huh. Yeah, either of those operations are, these are both examples of C2 types of um, movements. Okay? Um, with me so far? Yeah. Okay. Now, if we've talked about proper rotation, we're going to do improper rotation. Um, 
somehow the proper rotation makes me think of like um, the received pronunciation of English in Britain. And if it used to be that if you were on the BBC, you couldn't have your regional British accent. You had to talk like the Queen. Um, so, yeah, anyway. Um, prop, improper rotation is called SN, and this is two things. It's first rotation about an axis by 360 divided by n degrees, followed by a reflection across a mirror plane. that is perpendicular to the axis. So if a molecule has an improper rotation axis, it will be able to be rotated by 360 divided by n and then flipped through a mirror plane and be unchanged. You're doing a C2 or whatever plus yeah. a mirror. Okay. Yeah. Um, so for example, the simplest improper rotation is S1. This is where you take a molecule And let's go ahead and put the axis of rotation right here. And we're going to do steering wheel action by 360 divided by 1. 360, 360 degrees. What happens when you take an object and you turn it around 360 degrees? Oh, it's, the it's the same thing, right? But so after that, then we have to reflect the molecule through a mirror, and the mirror has to be perpendicular to our axis of rotation. So we're gonna pretend now that this molecule is hovering above the page, and the mirror is the page, so now we have to draw what the reflection is underneath the page, which would be what? This one yep. should be going back away from us. Uh -huh. Right. Because above the mirror, if this is our mirror, the OH group was going like this. So the reflection below the mirror has to have it going like that, right? And similarly, we get this. All right, so that's the mirror reflection. And a molecule is, uh, has S1 symmetry if you can do that and it's still the same thing. And we could ask, is it? just rotate it. Okay, so S1 symmetry is basically a mirror reflection, right? So if a molecule has S1 symmetry, it is the same as its mirror image and therefore cannot be chiral. What? The, the, the mirror, uh, for, for S symmetry, the mirror has to be perpendicular to whatever axis, axis you chose. When you say perpendicular, 90 degrees. So if the axis is coming out of the page, 
the axis is perpendicular to, to the page, and then the page has to be the mirror. Yep. Okay, so um, that's an S1 symmetry operation, but this molecule isn't uh, necessary. Well, what I'm trying to say, um, at least in the way we've okay, um, so that's. S1 symmetry is basically just reflection through a mirror. Um, and some of you are saying, well, this is actually the same thing because actually if I rotated that just by 180 degrees, it would be. Technically, the operation that gives you this molecule unchanged is S2. All right, so let's describe what that would be. S2 is we rotate not by 360, but by 180. So if we do that, then we've got this, right? And then we do the mirror plane reflection. You can imagine that molecule hovering over the mirror and we're going to draw what it sees on the other side. And that should be this. Okay. If a molecule has an improper axis of rotation, if it is S and symmetric, it cannot be chiral. And many of you looking at this might recognize this if we rotate it around this bond as a meso compound and its plane of symmetry becomes obvious, right? Right. So a chiral molecule cannot have any SN axes of symmetry. All right. So now let's use questions about that. Sorry. I'm going to connect it to an antiotopic and homotopic here in a second. Um, you can still, for the most part, it's still probably easier in trying to determine whether a molecule is chiral or not, fall back on the, is it the same as its mirror image? Um, the mirror image operation is technically an S, S axis, it's S1, right? Because the mirror, the S1 operation is I turn around 360 degrees and then I look in the mirror which is the same thing as me looking in the mirror without rotating 360 degrees, right? So, um, yes, if a molecule is chiral, it can't have, it can't be the same as its mirror image. Okay. Um, so let me show you how this applies to um, various groups in organic molecules. So, Homotopic, <laughs> you hate this, it's going to be a lot better after today. Homotopic groups are groups that are interconvertible by some CN rotation, by some CN axis, and homotopic groups are equivalent always even in chiral environments. Well, can you correct me that? Equivalent in all ways, chemically equivalent, yeah. Chemically equivalent, same NMR signal, same chemical shift. Uh, examples of homotopic groups. Here is propane. Here's HA. Do we also need magnetically equivalent? Yes, magnetically equivalent, NMR equivalent, absolutely. Homotopic groups are, they, yeah. Um, HA and HB, if I take my axis of symmetry and I, if I, if I take my axis and I run it through that central carbon, but my axis is in the plane of the page, and then if I 
take my steering wheel around that axis and I rotate it by 180 degrees, that's a C2 operation. Do you see how HA and HB become the same thing? Pick that up, twist it around, right? Okay, so if two groups are interchangeable by C2, they are homotopic, and they are the same always, um, which is a lot better than spelling rules in English, which don't actually apply in the way that, for example, I before E except after C, and then also in words like neighbor and way, and then to quote Brian Regan, and on weekends and holidays and all throughout May, You'll always be wrong no matter what you say. All right, so here's another example of homotopic groups in a molecule that is chiral. Um, this molecule is not the same as its mirror image. Nevertheless, if I put my axis again, through the middle of that molecule, through that carbon. And then here's the spoke of my wheel, here's my steering wheel, and I rotate by 180 degrees, or C2. Here is A and here is B, methyl group A versus methyl group B. Do you see how if I did that, C2 rotation, I'm going to get, again, exactly the same thing? Right? Um, so those methyl groups are homotopic. So this is, a, this is tricky because um, as I said this molecule is chiral. Um, it's not the same as its mirror image. I mean, I could draw the mirror image if you want, and then you could do a bunch of um, molecular acrobatics to try to get it to be the same thing, and you can't. Worlds without end. These are mirror images of each other. What about them? Oh, I just wrote it different, but. Oh, um, yes. Yeah, technically, yes, this is a good point. Uh, the question is whether I'm required to draw the methyl group over here. And the answer is it doesn't matter. As long as you get up or down right on a stereo center, whether the wedge or the dash is this way or that way turns out not to matter. And the reason is is because uh, whether you see it one way versus the other, and I can show you this after class, simply depends on which side you're looking at it from. So I'll, I'll show that to you, but um, after class if you want, I can do a quick demo with the models. So. Um, you may have learned that in chiral environments, like in a chiral molecule, uh, two of the same groups are diastereotopic. Not always. If, the, if they're interchangeable by a C2 axis, they're homotopic. Yeah? Are those spells homotopic as well? Um, yes. By C2. Yep, by a C2 symmetry axis. Yeah, go ahead. So for this, um, what matters is does the whole molecule, is it the same for, for C2, not just are the... Right, if the mole right, if the two, um, yes, you're considering are these two methyl groups and their environments interchangeable by a C2 axis? Um, let's talk enantiotopic. Oh, um, shoot. There's another, uh, 
in addition to groups, there's another thing we need to consider for topicity, and that is um, faces of planar molecules. So we're looking at the edge of acetone, and we've got, if it's in this plane, we have, uh, we'll call it face A and face B. If I can interchange these methyl groups by a C2 axis of symmetry, then the faces are homotopic. What that means is if I'm a nucleophile and I go to attack the ketone, I can, uh, this particular ketone acetone, my approach from the top side is identical to my approach from the bottom side, always, and even in a chiral environment. All right, let's do enantiotopic. Hey, yes? Yes. Yes. By magnetically equivalent, you mean in an NMR experiment, right? Yeah. Yes. Have to be. So one is magnetically equivalent, the No. I'll show you why. Okay. Um, so yes, homotopic groups are magnetically equivalent, but just because you're magnetically equivalent doesn't make you homotopic. So um, enantiotopic groups, I can't spell, can I? Enantiotopic groups are equivalent unless you're in a chiral environment. Enantiotopic. So enantiotopic groups are interconvertible by an SN axis and um, and they are equivalent unless you're in a chiral environment. So an example of enantiotopic groups. HA and HB are convertible not by a C2 axis of symmetry, right? Because if I did C2, I'm going to have chloro here and HB and HA. In order to complete that, to complete um, What am I doing? Um, right, sorry, this is, I was doing the wrong symmetry operation. So these two groups are, are um, interconvertible via S1. That is, I rotate by uh, 360 and actually my SN, S1 axis is right here into the plane of the page. I rotate around the steering wheel by 360. And then I reflect through a mirror plane that is the page. And then I get Okay, and that is, that's an S1 axis or a mirror plane of symmetry. It's totally fine if you just recognize that these two groups are mirror symmetric. Why would you even do the 360 rotation? It's just, it's just categorizing proper versus improper rotations. Um, so if two groups are interconvertible uh, by a mirror plane, they are enantiotopic. Um, another example of... 
Sorry. Yes. Do you ever get to place the mirror like this? Uh, on edge? Yeah. I mean, that's, that's my understanding. Yes. Of you can. So this is the... Um, we're out of time, so if you need to go, uh, you can. I'm going to try to answer this question quickly. Uh, so if you put the mirror plane here on edge, um, H A A. they don't look exactly the same. What do I have to do? What do I have to do to make them exactly the same? 180. Yeah, and, and in which way? Yeah, I sort of have to flip them over, and then I can see that they're the same way. So, um, what So the reason we go through the bother of doing the mirror plane this way is because it, I'm sorry, it doesn't make any sense. It does make sense, but I'm struggling to figure out how to explain it. So give me a, I'm going to work on that and I'll, I'll, give, I'll give you a little bit more on Monday. Are these two, are these fine possible? Sorry, what? Is this one and this final one, are these two frames possible? Not the question I asked, the one you concluded. This is that. Yeah. Is the last one this and this? Yeah, do you see how the shape of the molecule is identical? The only thing we've done is exchanged HA and HB? Yeah. So if you do a deuterium exchange, will it be this quite possible? Do it through what? Do it exchange. Do do exchange with the exchange. exchange. Yeah. If you do what with exchange, would it be possible? I'm sorry, I'm so, so not let's understanding. Assume you're, you're trying to convert it to hydrogen, right? And then you switch, change one to deuterium, and you do this. Will, will this to be quite possible? So one, of, maybe one of the hydrogen becomes a D. Oh, if the other hydrogen becomes a D, then no, it's not possible. Uh, the thought experiment that they want you to do, I think, in uh, perhaps in NMR is they ask you, well, if I replace this with something else versus HA versus HB and I got enantiomers, then those two groups are enantiotopic. I'm sorry. Um, I'm not very good at symmetry. So I'll work on that. Um, and I'll give you some better guidance next time. I apologize.